All right, welcome to week one of the quarter. And you see on uh, the summary uh, on the class site that the first lecture of the course will be on Paul, the man, and his ministry, and we'll cover some of the basic biographical information we know about Paul's life. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, his origin and background, including his upbringing, education, occupation, conversion, and calling to apostleship. Uh, and then we'll be looking at the subject of persecution and the promise of persecution that Jesus gave to the early church. Your reading with Dr. Schreiner will cover the first two chapters. Chapter 1 is uh, foundational for the entire work, where you'll be introduced to the theme of the book. Um, and then your reading of Paul's epistles will cover the first half of Paul's uh, greatest letter, that is the, the epistle to the church in Rome. And this has been called uh, the greatest letter ever written. Uh, it is Paul's magnum opus. I mean, it is the preeminent work of Paul's ministry uh, and the most comprehensive uh, outline of the gospel that we have in the Word of God. Uh, your first forum this week will be a discussion involving an illustration that Dr. Schreiner used in chapter 1. And so we'll be thinking of Paul's theology as a house under construction. So you'll uh, learn more about that illustration in your reading this week. So let's talk about Paul for a minute. Um, you know, I, I gave you that quote there uh, from Carson and Moo and gave you the statistics on how much of the New Testament uh, addresses uh, Paul or is written by Paul. Um, Paul's autobiography is found in Scripture, uh, and we find in Acts 22, verse 3, that he was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. Now, Tarsus was the capital of its Roman province. Uh, of course, this was uh, in modern-day Turkey. Uh, it was uh, Asia Minor at the time. Uh, it was a prosperous city, privileged. They were exempt from Roman taxation. They were well-cultured, and it was known for its schools. So Paul was a citizen of Tarsus. Uh, he refers to it as no ordinary city in Acts 21-39. Um, he was a, a, a Roman citizen, which he was one by birth, which was in, exceedingly rare. Um, that's mentioned in Acts 22-28. He inherited that privilege from his family. Uh, we don't know how or why. Perhaps his father or grandfather had served uh, Rome in a great way. But that uh, citizenship became important to Paul in his future missionary journeys uh, in the empire. Got him out of trouble at times as well. And I mentioned here some of the privileges of citizenship. Uh, you know, in Acts 16, in Philippi, where the earthquake happened, uh, Paul escaped detainment when his preaching was condemned uh, using the privileges of his citizenship. He avoided punishment in Acts 22 because of this. Uh, he could plead his case before the emperor's court in Rome in Acts 25. And so we also know that uh, Paul had three names, his first name, family name, and his surname. We only know um, his surname, Paul or Paulos. Okay, so occupation, tent maker. He was, you could say, bivocational. And Acts 18.3, uh, Cilicium was a product used to make tents, came from the region of Cilicia. Um, Paul would often use his tent-making skills to provide for himself while he did the work of the ministry. Uh, he labored in tent-making during the missionary work and those journeys in order not to burden the church with his support. We find mention of that in 1 Thessalonians 2.9. Uh, in Acts 22.3, he mentions being brought up 
in um, the city of Tarsus. And so this issue came up in a debate over where he spent his early years because it figures into his thought. Was Paul more indebted to a uh, to Greek or Jewish uh, philosophy for his teaching? He said in, in Philippians 3, 5 that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, probably meaning that he and his parents were linguistically and culturally Jewish in their orientation. And to whatever extent that that background, um, Paul's background influenced him, it was primarily Jewish in orientation. However, Hellenism, which is Greek culture, Greek thought, Greek influence and worldview, uh, was the prevailing view of his day. Much like postmodernism, or now we're really into um, post-Christian culture in our uh, worldview. And that's what people in our society are breathing a, a post-Christian um, worldview uh, where we're, some, we're, we're somewhere beyond the fact that there is, in the world's view, no absolute truth, no universal standard of morality, uh, no universal ethics. Well, Hellenism was the prevailing view in Paul's day, but he was Jewish in his orientation. In Acts 22.3, uh, he mentions that he was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and zealous for God. Not only was he a Hebrew of Hebrews, but he repeatedly emphasized in Acts, Galatians, and Ephesians that he was, by conviction, a serious and zealous follower of Judaism and a member of its strictest sect, the Pharisees, Acts 26.5. Paul, uh, Paul was a Pharisee who studied the oral law and the tradition of the elders, which was a body of regulations designed to interpret and supplement the written Mosaic law. Um, the Pharisees had significant disagreement with the Sadducees, stemming from the Pharisees' greater willingness to accept doctrines not clearly stated in the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah, the five books of Moses. Um, the Sadducees rejected the resurrection, and the Pharisees, in many ways, were the theological conservatives of their day, whereas the Sadducees were the theological liberals of their day. The Pharisees were were fundamentalists in many ways. Uh, and so they began as a good thing and got derailed uh, into legalism, but they were protecting orthodoxy in the beginning. Uh, Paul says he was trained under Gamaliel, um, a Pharisee of the school of Hillel. Hillel and his followers were basically known um, for their... Uh, you know, for their, in many ways, their teaching on marriage and divorce is often where the conversation comes up um, about the schools of Hillel and um, and their views of of marriage. Um, Saul or Paul's zeal for Judaism, probably under the leadership of his mentor Gamaliel, led him to persecute the early Christian movement. You see their uh, references to that. In Acts 22, he mentions coming near Damascus. And here we come to the most significant event in Paul's life, his conversion. Uh, his Damascus Road experience is described uh, once by Luke in Acts 9, uh, 3 through 6, twice by Paul himself, and again by Paul in Galatians 1. And so Paul uh, mentions that his companions saw a blaze of light. Although they did not see Jesus himself, they heard uh, him but did not understand the voice. This revelation that Christ gave to Paul came out of nowhere, came without any preparation. And it is the clearest uh, example of monergistic regeneration in the scriptures probably. By monergism, I mean one working. God unilaterally uh, regenerated Paul. Paul's on his way to kill Christians. He's not looking for God. He's not seeking Christ. He's not, not seeker-sensitive. He's looking to persecute the church. 
and Christ shows up and immediately transforms him by the power of his uh, presence. Um, you know, nowhere do we find that Paul was looking for any deeper experience in Judaism, uh, certainly not in Christianity. And he's warned by that voice, uh, it is hard for you to kick against the goads or the pricks, uh, meaning not that Saul had been resisting the Spirit's wooing, but that he should not now not now resist the will of God declared in this revelation from God. So this is a dramatic conversion experience, an immediate, sudden, unexpected turn from zealous Judaism and Christian persecution to a follower of Christ himself. It's what we pray for, for God to do for our lost loved ones, is to transform them uh, by, their, by God's power. Saul's conversion to Christ in uh, name changed to Paul was also a call to the ministry as a preacher of the gospel. This calling to be an apostle for Christ carried with it the special call to evangelize the Gentiles, so he became known as the apostle to the Gentiles. So let's talk about Paul's apostleship. Uh, apostleship is fundamental to Paul in his identity. Like the other apostles, he had seen the risen Lord and received a personal call from Christ to apostleship, uh, apostleship uh, and claimed an authority equal to that of Peter and the other apostles, um, whom, whom had been called super apostles in 2 Corinthians by some of Paul's opponents. Undoubtedly, Paul's knowledge of Christ and his teachings came from a variety of sources. Personal direct revelation from Christ uh, on the Damascus Road. Uh, he would have known of Christ um, through the passing along of early Christian traditions and teaching through Peter and the other believers during Paul's 15-day stay with him three years following his conversion. And then perhaps from observing the earthly ministry of Jesus firsthand and obviously from the Old Testament scriptures. Let's move on to Paul's life from conversion to his first missionary journey. Uh, Saul's conversion to Paul to his first missionary journey, of which there were three, um, should be, you know, or an important part of a Pauline course. Three years after he was converted, he visited Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter, and then visited Jerusalem again 14 years later. Using Galatians 1 and 2 and Acts 9 through 11, we can reconstruct the early years of Paul's missionary work. After his conversion, he stayed in Damascus a short time before leaving for Arabia. This time in Arabia uh, likely was a combination of hammering out his theology, uh, kind of like his version of Bible college and seminary, uh, but what also was a time of active ministry. After escaping in a basket through a window in the city wall, Paul then visited Jerusalem for the first time since his conversion. Some Christians were understandably suspicious of this famous persecutor of the church, but received him after Barnabas, the encourager, that's what his name means, persuaded them to receive Paul. He spent 15 days meeting with only Peter of the apostles and also James, the Lord's brother, uh, who had become the leader of the Jerusalem church and was, of course, the author of the book of James. After acceptance by the Christians, Paul was rejected by his old associates who tried to kill him, and then he fled back to Tarsus. Eventually, Barnabas called Paul away from Tarsus to Antioch to join in the ministry there, which seems to have been 12, 13 years after his conversion. This means Paul spent almost a decade back in Tarsus, and it is possible that it was during these years some of the things took place that Paul mentions but are not narrated in Acts. Uh, I've given you here a chronology of Paul's missionary career, beginning with his conversion, uh, anywhere from 32 to 35, if the crucifixion was between 30 and 33, 30 to 33. Um, seems like the last time I studied that, I was convinced that it was the year 30, that the year uh, of, the, of the crucifixion. And so it would have been not long after the crucifixion that Paul is converted. And then you see there some important dates in Paul's life that I'll leave with you to examine. Um, so Paul was an apostle. The apostle to the, 
uh, Gentiles. And what is an apostle? Well, apostolos, the Greek term, means one sent. Sent on mission, uh, commissioned on purpose by someone. Uh, the qualifications of full apostleship of the Twelve and of Paul were these. The apostles were chosen, called, and sent by Christ himself. Their commission was a direct call from Christ, number one. Number two, to be an apostle, um, you had to uh, be, be taught by Jesus uh, and be an eyewitness of his ministry, of his words, deeds, and specifically of his resurrection. Paul met this requirement because of a unique circumstance. Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road after the resurrection and, and uh, revealed himself. Um, uh, number three, apostles were endowed in special measure by the Holy Spirit. Apostles are confirmed and authenticated by God's blessing on their labors, often through signs and miracles. Um, apostles are not restricted to the local church. They serve the, the entire church for life. Uh, and by the way, uh, one of the reasons that we do not have apostles today, even though I know some claim that, uh, are, are these reasons. And in addition to that, um, when Paul came along, the, the other apostles affirmed him. Now that the uh, apostles are dead, there's no one to affirm. There's no apostolic succession because the apostolic era is over. The foundation of the church has been laid. And so uh, the office of apostle is unique in the New Testament. Um, so let me skip over some things here for the sake of time. We're almost 20 minutes in. Um, I just want you to read uh, some of these key passages that we've looked at. Uh, in this session, um, of course, Acts chapter 9, Galatians 1, uh, 2 Corinthians is, uh, you'll, you'll be reading that as Paul's autobiography. Um, so we'll be, uh, you'll be reading and we'll be looking at more details of Paul's background. Uh, but let me, let me mention in closing that when we look at Paul and his conversion, it reminds us that no one, no one is too hard for Christ to save and Christ to reach. No one is too far. Uh, Jesus uh, can save and does save. Uh, and by his own power, he uh, saved the Apostle Paul. Um, you know, if you had polled the early church, and said, who do you think is the least likely person to ever become a follower of Jesus? I think at the top of their list would have been Saul of Tarsus. And look who we're studying in this course. The Apostle Paul, the man that was the a persecutor of the church, who was holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and he was giving his approval. That man, on his way to arrest Christians, throw them in prison, have them uh, martyred for the faith, becomes a follower of Jesus himself. Friends, there is no one that you're praying for, no one you're evangelizing, that is too difficult of a case for Jesus. Um, remember where God has brought you. You were saved by the grace of God. Praise Him. Remember that shyness and timidity uh, do not disqualify you from being used by God. Uh, God can use and does use weak, broken, humble vessels. And don't forget um, that it is only by the grace of God that we are who we are. Um, and praise God that he redeemed us. Amen.